My name is Vicki Quarles and I am interviewing Dan Wilson today. Today's date is April 20th, 2012 and we are in Boulder, Colorado. So Dan, tell me what's the date in year of your birth? The date in what? The year you were born, the date in... Oh, I was born on March 25th, 1925. Okay, and where were you born, Dan? I was born in my mother's bedroom. Wow. In Boulder? At, out in North Boulder and what was then 7th Avenue. What's the address of that house? Oh, at that time it was 802 7th Avenue. And that street is now? Uh, 802 Hawthorne. Okay. So you were born in your mother's bedroom? Yep. Wow. So no hospital? No hospital. Okay. Boulder Community Hospital was just a little building at that time. It had, uh, I think, maybe room for nine patients. Wow. Had a big front porch on it. So it was pretty? Yeah, it's the same location as the hospital now. So what year did your mother and father come to Colorado? Uh, my mother and father came from Iowa and they had uh, five children. My father bought a one-ton Model T truck brand new and put all the stuff in it and put a canvas cover over kind of like a covered wagon. And mm -hmm. Come through, it was all muddy roads mm -hmm. that came through and when he came to Boulder it came in on Arapaho, which was Channel 7, and there was no bridge across Boulder Creek at that time. Wow. And they had to ford Boulder Creek, and they camped out in what is now Ebonfine Park. Hmm. You know where that is? Yes. And they met some people there in Ebonfine Park that uh, lived on 7th Avenue and were moving, and they were camping out there. And they, they said they knew of a property out where they lived it was somebody wanted to get rid of and move out some go someplace else and so my parents went out and looked at that property and they wound up trading the one ton truck for the whole thing and there was a, a house and a barn and a chicken house and a couple of other outbuildings I think there was eight acres mm. with a Grapevines and berries and apple trees and mm. cherry trees, nice. and pear trees. And it was a really nice place. And then it had a, a pasture, I think, also in it. And a lot of the ground was available for planting crops and stuff. This was the 802 house? Well, at that time, it was still the same house that still standing there at that address. But we own property on both sides of that house and behind it, down almost to the next street. Okay. And do you remember how many acres that was? Oh, I think originally it was around six to eight acres. Uh, and then my mother was instrumental in having Grape Avenue built. So she could sell some of her property that she that couldn't get access to from Hawthorne or from mm -hmm the other street below it. Okay. So anyway, she put in Grape Avenue and wow. sold some of the property. Wow. Now what year did they come here? I don't have any, after the war sometime. After uh, World War I? World War II. World War II, they came, when did they come from Iowa to Colorado? In 1917. 1917, okay. Yeah. Okay, and they had five children already? Yeah. By the time they came here, and then there were, there were, uh, well, I think they had six children because I, I had one son, brother who died in Iowa, so they he died as a baby, and uh, the other five came, and there were three more born here: my sister and I, and my, one of my brothers. Okay. So I had five brothers and three sisters. Wow, big family. Yeah. So what, what kind of chores did you have to do? Do you remember? Oh, I had all kinds of stuff. I, I was in charge of the chickens. And we had no water in the house. We had a well, and I was responsible to. We had a 40-gallon hot water 
heater sitting on top of a coal wood stove. Wow. In the kitchen, and I had to fill that up for to, to do all the hot water for all the use of the whole family. So I'd usually fill that up a couple of times a day. I had to cut all the wood and bring in the coal and stuff for the coal stove. Because the coal stove had to go all the night and day, summer and winter, uh, to keep the water hot, you know. Okay. So not, and that was also the heating source for the kitchen and dining room. And we had another big circulating heater in the living room that heated uh, the living room and my mother's bedroom and the other bedrooms in the house. Okay. And in the winter when it got real cold, everybody would bring out their mattresses and put them on the floor of the living room. And sometimes the stove would get red hot mm. when it was on a real cold night. <laughs> it was kind of fun. So how many rooms were in that home that you grew up in? Oh, there was a real large kitchen. <clears throat> And there was a front porch, a big front porch, not big by today's standards, but it was maybe uh, 8 by 12 or something like that. And you entered the front, front porch into the dining room, which was mm -hmm. basically a combination library and dining room. We had a big library or dining table that would seat 13 people had seven leaves made out of black walnut. Oh, wow. And we had a black walnut library table that matched it and a black walnut mm -hmm. bookcase that went in an L shape that was full of books. My father was an avid reader. Really? Okay. And um, we had, and then you went from that room into the kitchen and it was a big kitchen that we didn't have a bath in the house at that time. We had an outhouse. Outhouse. And uh, then you went from the outhouse into the living room, which mm -hmm. was, was a fairly large room. And it had a big window looking out. Mm -hmm. You could see the flat irons from the, out the window. And then there was a couple of gla double the glass doors that went into my mother's bedroom. Then you went through another door into another big bedroom, and through that bedroom into another bedroom. Mm -hmm. And through that bedroom there was a sleeping porch oh. where I used to sleep. Nice. And sometimes I'd wake up with my covers frozen to the wall. Really? <laughs> oh my. So it wasn't the warmest room in the house. <laughs> wow. So I was kind of, I had an interesting life. Because Childhood, especially because I was brought up during the Depression, mm -hmm. and nobody had any money to do anything. And uh, but all the schools were open for recreation in the evening, you know, after mm -hmm. school was out, and in the summer. Okay. And the people on WPA or NRA or some of those people were were school teachers and artists and all kind of people and they would they would give you music classes and art classes and recreation classes and you know they were professional mm -hmm. things and the school was open like from five o'clock until ten o'clock at night so, that so all the kids had something to do and nobody got in trouble and there were no gangs and no mm -hmm. fights and I just had a wonderful time you know nobody needed anything or wanted anything so they they knew how to get along with one another. What was your favorite activity when you were Oh, there? I was into everything. I loved baseball, and track, mountain climbing, and mm -hmm. roller skating. I was a great roller skater. And then, uh, I was into some plays and stuff that they would put on different times through the recreation department. And I used to sing a little and dance a little, and okay. I was voted the best dancer in Boulder at one time. Wow, very good. But uh, so was music a big part of your life growing up? Well, I didn't really start music. Uh, I always liked to fool around with music. Uh, I never had a professional teaching. Mm -hmm. I've never taught anything. 
I learned all the music on my own. And uh, I used to pound around on pot and pans with drumsticks and stuff like that. And when I was in the Navy, I was in Miami, Florida, teaching Russians electronics. And I had a USO dance as a Navy band was going to play for. And the bus that they were on got in an accident and the drummer broke his foot. Mm, that's not good for And so they asked us, anybody knew how to play drums when they got to the I said, oh, sure I do. I never played drum in my life. <laughs> 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 so anyway, I went up and sat in with them and they liked the way I played. <laughs> And I played with them for about six months until I left there. So that was my first in introduction to music, and uh, wow. so it was a lot of fun. It's really, a natural talent. Yeah, I, I did have. I was. Uh, I had a great feel for how music went, mm -hmm. and hmm. I always considered a drummer not a not a musician, but a more or less of uh, setting the. The, the tone of the music, right. whether it was Latin music or mm. waltzes or you know, hot music or blues or whatever, the drummer had a lot to do with how the how the music was performed, mm -hmm. and he had set the the mood to the music. Right. And that's, I was never a flashy drummer. I was just a solid drummer, mm. so and I played all my all my life, and, and I mm. played. After the war, I played with a country western band, and uh, played a lot of little out buildings around here from oh, Platteville and Longmont, and hmm. a lot of towns east there. I can't remember their names. Uh, Frederick was one, another. Do you remember? Guy had a tavern called the Poor's Tavern, hmm. and. They had big dances out there on the weekends. And we had a little thing called the Colorado Playboys, and we played for them. Had a big attendance. So, when you were a kid, did you ha was there music in your house? A My lot? father was a fantastic music musician. Or? He could your play. Grand, your father. My grand, father. Your father was a musician. Yeah, he was. Uh, he could play piano, organ. Violin, wow. and flute, clarinet, did bagpipes. He, did he play all of that as a child? Uh, I think so. Well he used to play for d dances and weddings okay. and parties, and he was a he was a adventurer. Hmm. And his family originally came from Virginia, and they were they had a land grant from Lord Baltimore wow. in Virginia and my part of the family, my father's part of the family moved from Virginia to Iowa and my grandfather that I'd never met built a big hump, bought a big farm there and built a big red brick house on it. And he raised Poland China hogs hmm. and he raised a lot of other crops as you know to provide food for them. Mm. And he was also a cattle broker. He, mm. you know, bought and sold cattle. And he was quite a prominent person in that area. Mm. And my mother came from German immigrants and they had a farm also in Burlington, Iowa. And uh, my father came down back from the Alaska Gold Rush and my mother was a maid in her father's, my father's house. And so they met each other, and I guess they liked each other. My father was 22 years older than my mother. Wow. My father was 57 when I was born, and my mother was 35. Hmm. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, he was, he was kind of a, an old man when I was a little boy. Mm -hmm. And he was a real stern person, you know, real, real strict. Real strict, and you know, there's something went on between my mother and father after I was born that they never stayed together anymore. Hmm. They never showed any affection to one another. Okay. And uh, they respected one another, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, that was about the size. Yeah. But 
And I don't know what that's none of my business anyway, but something happened between them. Okay. And uh, well, most of my brothers didn't get along well with my father because hmm. he was a quite a disciplinarian. Okay. And, what kind uh, of work did your father do? My father uh, <coughs> raised flowers. Really? And when he came, uh, he bought the land to, to raise gladiolias and peonies and things like that. And Long's Gardens was down to, on Broadway on Hawthorne. And when he came back, he saw that, that the garden's there, and so he thought, well, maybe I'll go and check that place out. And he went down and talked to Mr. Long. And Mr. Long had his seed store, seed store in downtown Boulder at that time. And uh, he was quite busy in that, and he had a catalog business also. And he needed a foreman to run the gardens. And when he interviewed my father, he said, well, you're it. And he went to work for Long's the next day. Hmm. And uh, so then he wanted to raise flowers on his own, so he bought a lot of gladiolia bulbs and things from, from Long's. And we planted probably five or six acres of gladiolus. And then we rented some miller land and planted some more. And my father retired from, or wanted to be on his own. And he raised flowers and, and bulbs and uh, sold them in his little truck in the summertime. Hmm. And he'd sell glads for a dollar a dozen or something like that. Hmm. And he went to Estes Park and Grand Lake and all a lot of the other places where the Texas people came in in the summertime and they had money to buy flowers. So that's where he sold them. And he had his, he'd put his little truck down in the streets in Boulder and sell flowers there during the week. And, hmm. and he had a pretty good income from it. And he fell off of a house putting up a radio antenna uh, and broke both of his feet. And he was unable to work anymore, and that was during the Depression. And he got a job with the WPA, mm -hmm. sitting down on the Seventh Avenue on Broadway, counting the cars that went up, oh. <laughs> went up highway to, to <laughs> North Boulder to see if they was ever going to improve the road. Okay. Oh. So you know, there's something to do, mm -hmm. and. Um, Eventually, you know, he was walking on his knees for a long time. Hmm. He was finally able to walk again, There's which a, surprised the doctors. Yeah, I bet. There's a, a, an old shed in the, the 900 block of Hawthorne Street currently that's still there. And I was told that that shed used to be, uh, there used to be bulbs were stored there. Do you be know? Be what? The bulbs from the, the gladiolas. Do you know? Not on Hawthorne. Shed? Not on Ninth and Hawthorne. Somewhere in there, there was. Do you know of any old shed in that area where bulbs were? No. Stored? See, I was on Eighth. The Ninth was the next street down. Okay. And there was a person, people called Crowley, that lived on that corner, and another person named uh, Damon lived on the other corner. And then there was some people called Bars that lived after that. And none of those were involved with Long's at all. Okay. One was a milk distributor, Crowley distributed milk from the farms. He had a truck and would bring the milk to the dairies. Mm. And Damon was a realtor and uh, insurance man and raised chickens for eggs and I worked for him cleaning his damn chicken houses. <laughs> what a stinking work. job yes, that is. That's hard work. <laughs> chickens are dirty, dirty animals. And uh, anyway, I'd been nickel an hour for a 10 hour day. Wow. And How old were you when you were doing I was that? 10 years old. 10. Okay. And that's when my father was hurt and couldn't work. And so at one time I was making 12 50 a week and supported the whole family. And you were but, the youngest. Uh, I was the youngest. Of nine, is that yeah. correct? Okay. So that was around the Depression time. Yeah, that was in the 30s, probably. Right. So yeah, I was, you know, maybe 35. 
Mm -hmm. and in 39, my had a brother that, uh, my oldest brother, his name was Samuel, he was a guard on a, for the railroad up in Oregon, guarding a trestle. And they were concerned about sabotage from German people because we were giving war relief to England and we weren't involved in the war yet. But he was shot there hmm. on guard duty one time. And they never have really uh, determined what the, how it occurred. Hmm. Or whether someone shot him or he shot himself. Or they, they haven't ever really found that out. And uh, my other brother went up to, to investigate it at the time. But he didn't find out anything either. Hmm. Wow. But, uh, he was buried in, in Boulder and uh, had a big ceremony. At the, he used to work for Cress's, which was a 10 cent store. Mm -hmm. And he used to be the stock, stocker at Cress's. And he knew a lot of, you know, girls. He was six foot four and very handsome guy. I got a picture of him. Mm -hmm. And uh, his place just packed with young women. His funeral. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> you know, I, I never thought of my brother as a romantic. <laughs> he was, but how he much was, older was he? Oh, he was considerably older than I was, and I didn't hardly know him at all. He came home and uh, stayed for maybe six months at one time. And he didn't stay in the house, he built himself a, house, a room in the chicken house. Really? Well, the chickens were not there anymore. <laughs> but uh, he fixed it up into a nice little room he had. And uh, then he moved on, and that's, mm -hmm. after that he was up in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know much about it. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever told me anything. People kept things more quiet back then. Yeah, you know, I was the last to know anything. Okay. You know, I didn't know much about any of my brothers, really. I had one brother who was in the National Guard when the war, before the war broke out. And, and uh, I think 1940 they drafted him, or mm -hmm. we called the National Guard in, and he was went down to Fort, whatever that thing is in Colorado Springs. What does he call it? The Air Force Academy. No, no. the Air Fort, Fort Carson. Fort Carson. And he did a training there, and um, he made himself a. a top sergeant. He was a top sergeant in the army. Hmm. And he was in the invasion of Italy and somewhere in Africa and hmm. Battle of the Bulls. He had six silver, purple hearts. Wow. And he was in the hospital for 17 years and didn't even know who he was. Hmm. And they came out with some new treatments and uh, I think he went through electric shock and insulin shock and all kinds of things. They came out with some drug and he started re remembering things. Mm -hmm. He was finally able to come home and live with my mother. And she lived with, he lived with her until she died and then he kind of reverted back a little mm -hmm. bit. He lived with me for a while and he got to the point that uh, started drinking some and uh, mm -hmm. My daughters were kind of afraid of him, so I had to do something else with him. Mm -hmm. And he went back in the VA hospital. Yeah, that was a hard. And he died in the VA hospital. Okay. But, but he declared my mother as his dependent when he was in the service. Mm. And when he became uh, hospitalized, she, she was his dependent and so she was able to get money from him all at those 17 years he was in the hospital so he he uh, took good care of my mother mm -hmm. and when he passed away he had you know pretty good he had a 
conservator that put his money in the bank and given it to him as he wanted it. And he had a several hundred thousand dollars in the bank when he passed away. Mm -hmm. And I inherited some of that, which was able enabled me to buy a house and a few other things, which was good for me, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, actually, he was a guy that really never had anything, but mm -hmm. gave a lot to mm -hmm. the whole family. Mm -hmm. And his rewards will be somewhere else, I think, you know. Mm -hmm. So tell me more about your mother. It sounds like she... Oh, my mother was, was, was an angel. She uh, she attended a Lutheran school when she was a young woman, mm -hmm. and she studied home economics and okay. uh, English. And she was a beautiful writer, mm -hmm. and uh, and she stood uh, she studied sewing and all. Mm -hmm. She could make up. She made all the kids' clothes and she stuff when she and she made the quilts and all that other mm -hmm. stuff, rugs and. And then she did all the cooking and canning, and I never saw how wow. one woman could work so hard and still have the time to to have me sit on her lap and read me Bible stories. <laughs> wow. Which was, uh, you know, a real joy for me. And she used to bake bread, you know, and that was mm -hmm. one of my first memories of us going in the kitchen and smelling a fresh mm -hmm. baked bread, mm -hmm. you know. Nothing like it. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Once in a while, she'd take some of the dough and put it in the in a deep fryer and fry it and mm. put it rolled in sugar and they used to call those sofa pias, I think. Mm -hmm. Give me one of those; they were really tasty treat. So she worked hard. Her her life. Oh was yeah, she worked awfully hard. And my my father was, you know, pretty crippled for all the times during the war mm -hmm. and. Um, she became very active in the American War Mother. She had four children in the service. One of my daughter, or one of my sisters, was General Patton's secretary. Hmm. And my had one, one brother that was in the Air Force, and he would, never got out of the United States. He was down in some little Air Force station in, around uh, Lamar, Colorado, or someplace down there in Norm. But he spent all his time there. And, uh, and uh, my sister was in the WAX. And I was in the Navy. And, and my brother Ed was in the Air Force. I, don't, I can't say who the other one was that was in the service. One of them. Okay. So, so you had a well on your property. Yeah. Um, what about for irrigation on the Oh, Where well, I don't know if you know anything about the Silver Lake Ditch. Mm -mm. Tell me about that. At the Silver Lake Ditch was the main, Boulder's main water supply, Silver Lake. And um, for irrigation purposes, a lot of the farmers got together and built this ditch that comes along Boulder Creek up along the side of the mountain above the creek. Sometimes it's an, an open at the ditch and sometimes it's in a pipe. Mm -hmm. And you may have seen it if you're driving up Boulder Canyon along, mm -hmm. going along the side of the canyon and it comes out <coughs> of the canyon about 3rd and Pearl Street mm -hmm. and takes off to the you know where Red Rocks is on Maple Thing? Well, it goes around there and then back along above 3rd Street all the way north to, uh, used to be a lake called uh, Woodland Lake, I think, out there, and it dumped into that. And the city, all the property owners, like my folks, had water rights out of that ditch. And Long's had a lot of water rights out of it. And we had little uh, gates, they called them, that you'd open up at mm -hmm. the ditch up on the top of the hill, and the water would come down the little irrigation ditch on each side of Hawthorne, 
or 7th Avenue, and one was Long's Ditch. Okay. It went to uh, his water, and the other one was for our property. And uh, so we irrigated all our things through that ditch. It was all, we'd had no sprinkler systems or city water or anything. Mm -hmm. So uh, everything was irrigated through that ditch. And that's where I played when I was a little boy. I would play in the ditch and uh, the gravel road and I'd make little dams and stuff and lakes and mm -hmm. play with my cars and trucks. And <laughs> it was an interesting time. Mm -hmm. But that ditch was really, uh, really an important thing for the people in North Boulder. Mm -hmm. Because, see, I think the water rights only started maybe on, uh, maybe on, on our street. I went up to 8th and 9th Street, and uh, those were the people that were doing all the irrigating and raising vegetables and things. Did you have... And then long, huh? Okay. Did you have a garden on your property? Oh, we had a huge garden. Huge garden. Yeah, we had probably two or three acres in garden and we'd have corn and radishes and celery and you know everything beans and mm -hmm. everything even strawberries and all kind of berries and that's we'd can all that stuff my mother would can all that stuff and uh, well I was telling somebody about that today at a thing we had we, were, we had an Earth Day thing we, we were talking about and we, we had a, under the house, we had what, what they called a cellar. And the entrance was from outside. You opened a cellar door and go down some steps and they had a concrete thing in there. Fairly large room and it had shelves in there. That we'd store all the canned goods that we canned. And like in the fall, when the peaches season started, we'd probably get five bilches of peaches mm. and uh, she'd can carrots and beets and corn and you know tomatoes and mm. beans and everything wow. strawberry jam and mm. all the berry jam and we had no freezers there was no freezers at that time we didn't have any electricity in our house originally what, and we had what? coal oil lamps, okay. and um, so that was, you know, not they don't put out too much light. Mm -hmm. So people went to bed fairly early when we were young. And, uh, we did get electricity, and I had water put in after I got out of the Navy, and had a built bathroom built onto the house. So you lived in that house? as an adult? After Pardon? You, you lived in that house when you grew up? Did you I was that? born in that house and I lived in it till I went in the Navy when I was 17. Okay. And I came back and lived in it after I got out of the Navy. And then uh, I went up to Estes Park the summer that I got out of the Navy and I stayed in the National Park Hotel up there and worked for a grocery store. Hmm. and. Uh, and I decided that I'd been in Portland, Oregon when I was in the Navy. We had a ship that was hit by two kamikazes in Okinawa. And we came from Okinawa up the Columbia River to Portland, Oregon to have it repaired. And I met a girl in Portland I thought was a pretty special person. And so I decided I had a friend, of, my brother had a girlfriend that was working there in Estes Park who was going to go to Seattle. So she said that I could help her drive and we, she'd take me up to Portland. So I went with her and uh, got in Portland and I couldn't find that girl at all. Mm -hmm. well, I got a job with Internal Revenue Service as a deputy a collector of taxes. And I didn't like that so I didn't stay at long at that. But there was a girl that worked there that had a liking for me and she 
I was living in a rooming house and I got the flu one time and all these girls come knocking on my door and give me stuff to eat and whatnot. And this one girl says, well, you should, we got an extra bedroom in our house, you come and stay with, with us. And that was the biggest mistake I ever made in my life. It, uh, she wound up uh, telling them that I was her boyfriend and that we were going to get married. And that, and that came about, not to my liking, but it happened. But, and I had two children that I uh, gave up for adoption. That, uh, which, uh, you know, I had, was just out of the Navy and I didn't, had never done anything. And, and on my wedding, I'd never ever been to a wedding. And I missed a wedding reception. <laughs> you know, I took off and we had a cottage where the people I was working for had a cottage down by the sea. And, uh, they let me have it for my honeymoon. And I took my wife out of the church and hopped in the car and took off. <laughs> Missed a big reception. <laughs> she never told me anything about it till after it was all over. <laughs> and so I'm pretty I'm not very worldly along those lines. Mm -hmm. That's okay. So at some point you came back to Boulder. Yeah, I, uh, I, <clears throat> well, after I came down from Dusty's Park, I came back to Boulder. And I got a job as a cost accountant for the Austin company who was building Rocky Flats. Mm. And I worked out there as a cost accountant for Rocky Flats. and. Uh, they wanted me to go overseas and, and be take over their, some of their plants and do their accounting and stuff for them. And I told them I, I had to take care of my mother. So my father died two days before I got out of the Navy. And so when I came home, I had saved up considerably a lot of money to go to college on. And I was wanted to be a minister. And uh, so my father had a mortgage on the house and a lot of so I paid off that with my college money and gave some money to my mother so she could be all right. And then she was getting money from my brother after he got mm -hmm. put in a hospital. So she was taking being taken care of. So then I decided to move on and uh, oh I went back up to well I, that's when I went that's when I went back to Oregon mm. and, uh, and then uh, I got I wasn't happy in Oregon at all it was very depressing I worked outside with a telephone company. Mm. Not much sun there. I'm not talking too much about Boulder, am I? But uh, we're, we're getting, we're getting there. Well, <laughs> anyway, I'm talking about everything besides Boulder. That's okay. I can tell you a lot about North Boulder. Well, what? Tell me more. What? What else do you want to tell well, me? Well, like I used to walk to school. Uh, and what school was that? And I uh, at Washington School okay. and Casey Junior High School, Boulder High School. But uh, along Broadway at that time, let's say from 7th Avenue, mm -hmm. the sidewalk started at Evergreen and it would go down and it, there used to be a, by the, you know where the farmer's ditch comes across mm -hmm. Broadway? Well there, there was a place called the Moss Rock, Moss Rock Cottage Court. Mm -hmm. And they had a lot of little cabins that were made out of moss rock. And, and on the corner there was a big brick house that they had apartments in. And the family that owned the place lived there. And they had a skelly filling station there. And across the street was a grocery store 
called Boland's Grocery Store. And, you know, there was kind of a little neighborhood grocery. You could eat bread and potatoes and butter and stuff like that there. And my mother had a charge account there and sent me to the store to get something once in a while. I'd give them a note and they'd give me the stuff and I'd go home. And but then, on further down, right across from Washington School, there was a, a big wooden house with a garage behind it, a four-car garage. And this guy, his name was Brown, and he was a Pierce Arrow and Duesenberg automobile dealership in Boulder. And I can remember going to school, walking by this thing, and he'd have this big Pierce Arrow parked out there in front in the Duesenberg. Have you ever seen a Duesenberg? I don't think so. They're the most classic car in the world ever made. And they big long hood, and they got big uh, mm -hmm. chrome things mm -hmm. coming out of it, like the exhaust pipes. And then they go down into the fenders, and it was convertible. They were all convertibles with a rumble seat. And, they're worth uh, like three or four million dollars if you could find one. At that time, you could buy a Duesenberg for about three thousand mm. dollars, and you could buy a Pure Cheryl for fifteen hundred. You could buy a Chevrolet for seven hundred, and a Ford for five hundred. <laughs> so, you know, was, it, things have just gone crazy from when I was a little kid, money-wise, you know. Mm -hmm. Like I bought a Buick, it cost me thirty thousand dollars, and I had when I got out of the service, I had a, a I bought a, um, oh, it's a, made by Cadillac, called a LaSalle, mm -hmm. and it was a twelve-cylinder thing and had a hood this long on it, and it was a convertible, and. <coughs> It was the fanciest car you ever saw. And uh, I drove it to Denver one day and parked it uh, next to a store I was going to. And I looked out and there was a bunch of people looking at it. And uh, so I went out there and I says, you like my car? And he says, yeah, you want to sell it? And I says, oh, I don't know. I don't think you got enough money to buy it. <laughs> And they says, what do, you, what do you want for it? And I think I, I bought it for $1,500. And I says, oh, I'd take 5000 for it. He says, we'll buy it. And they were gypsies. <laughs> and this old gypsy lady come out and reached in between her breasts and brought out a roll of $100 bills and started to peel them off. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> They had some somebody else to sell it to, and to make more money off of it. So I, I sorry I ever sold that car because it would be worth a ton of money today if I had a car. But, but I've had a lot of cars and a lot of dogs. <laughs> did, speaking of dogs, did you have animals and, and pets growing up? Yeah, I had a little, a little dog named Jeff. Okay. A little black mongrel dog, a wonderful little dog, and uh, he was a jumper. He could jump an eight-foot fence, hmm. and he was with me all the time and, until I went in the Navy. Hmm. And there's a neighbor of mine that, that took him, but the dog that I can remember, that there's a na woman named Mrs. Miller that lived across the street from us, and she had a big house in a big barn, you know, a regular farm barn. And she had a couple of cows, but she had this dog named Wooly that she had chained up to her by her chicken house. And this is the meanest dog in the world, I think. But anyway, once he broke that chain and he come out and he bit me, mm. he bit me twice and, and I still are carrying the scars from a, a doctor. Uh, he bit me on the butt, on the butt, and mm -hmm. the doctor had to put things way into the things and clean them out. He says he never saw such deep oh, dog bites in his life. How old were you? 
Do you remember? Oh, I was. Couldn't have been probably maybe in the second grade or third grade. I got polio when I was in the third grade. And I had to, I had to go down to, they sent me to St. Luke Hospital and I was down there for a year. I had my twist, my knee, neck was all twisted over over my shoulder. Huh. And they'd put hot packs on me for 20 minutes and then they'd take those off and put ice packs on me for 20 minutes and hmm. they did that for months and one day they took one off and put the other on my neck snapped back. <laughs> really? And I've been all right since. Wow. That was the treatment for polio at the time. Well, that, that was a treatment for the kind of polio I had. Okay. I didn't have the type that's real crippling. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some people that I went to school with at that time that it had the crippling polio and, uh, you know, hmm. or really crippled. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was never crippled yeah, for that. So when you got bit by the dog, did, did the doctor come to your home? Was there... Uh, yeah, we, we, didn't, uh, we didn't have a telephone. And my... I fell out of an apple tree one time and broke my arm. <laughs> And I fit on a rock, and the ladder come down, and hit me, and broke my arm here and here. And my arm looked like this. And my dad wanted to grab a hold of it and set it for me. I said, "No, no, no." <laughs> so my mother went over to a neighbor's place in Damon's, and they had a phone, and she called a doctor, and he came out, and he says, "Boy, that's pretty bad." He says, "You got a magazine?" And my mother said, yeah, she had a magazine, so he took a magazine, pulled it over and taped it around my arm and put me in his car and took me. He had an x-ray machine, which was just recently came out. The guy that uh, invented x-rays, within a month after he invented the x-ray, they had x-ray machines in working for diagnostic work and broken mm -hmm. bones and things. Mm -hmm. And I, he just gave all that to the, his findings to the medical profession, mm -hmm. which was a wonderful thing to do. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I found that out when I worked in physics at the university. But anyway, he x-rayed my arm and set it, and it's been in good shape ever since. Mm -hmm. And I had a cast on it when I was in one of the schools in grade school and the Wizard White was a big football hero at CU at the time mm. who later became a Supreme Court Justice mm. Mm. and uh, he came out to school and he autographed my my cast for me. I should have kept that. <laughs> so that was kind of interesting mm -hmm. to, to have been autographed by a Supreme Court Justice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway, that's another story. So, but, uh, what do you remember about um, your father working for Longs? And, and I really don't know long. much about that. Okay. Uh, I was real little at mm -hmm. the time. That you know, say. I was born, uh, the third child born in Boulder, and mm -hmm. he had been working for him some time. Okay. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was 10 years old, he was, he was 57 when I was born. So when I, 10 years later, he would have been 65 or, you know, or 67 or, so he was an old man. Right. And I know he threw a, a baseball for me to catch when he was 75. And he threw so hard I couldn't catch it. And I was maybe 12. Mm -hmm. And he was a fantastic rifle shot. Mm -hmm. He'd put a nail in the barn and get back by the house, which was like 100 yards away. Mm -hmm. And he'd hit the nail and drive it into the barn. He'd go to turkey shoots and win the turkeys all the time. Mm -hmm. You ever heard of a turkey shoot? Mm -hmm. But he was quite a guy. He was a. I never saw anything he couldn't do. Hmm. 
but he was a mean man too. Mm. So he had a temper. He kicked me one time, mm. and I shook my finger at him, and I said, "Don't you ever do that again." Mm. And he never he respected me after that. Mm. You know, because I stuck up for myself, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. And so I got along well with him, and we worked well together. And, and uh, he taught me how to drive his little truck and, and <laughs> pick flowers, and we'd go sell them together and stuff. Okay. So he, uh, I got a telegram that I went down to join the Navy, and they sent him a telegram saying that I was too young. I had to get his permission to join, and he wrote back on the back of the telegram, and I still have that someplace, mm. that he gave my permission to join the Navy. <laughs> but, that, but then I went to work for Long. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. I'd heard that. And uh, so I worked for probably from the time I was. 13 till I was 17 oh, okay. for long. Okay. And I used to cut all the gladiolus at 3 o'clock in the morning and bring them in for to sell. You know, they had little, uh, like, vases mm -hmm. on two, several shelves, and I'd fill all those vases with gladiolus in the mornings, and mm -hmm. people would come by and buy them. And mm -hmm. I'd do the same thing every day. And I had a, a new Ford truck that he gave me to, that I'd bring home with me at night to, so I could go out early in the morning. And um, I'm going to have to go down there and wake them up to get the truck. And so, so actually, J.D. Long was probably the finest man I ever knew in my life. He was, uh, oh, I don't know how old he was when I first went to work for him. But he was white-haired, and he'd drive a car, and he'd take me to school, and he'd never get out of a low gear. <laughs> he'd be talking to me and driving down the street and putting along maybe five miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he, there was a place called Alba Dairy just across the street from the seed store. And along the seed store, you know, or Pearl Street and Broadway is. Mm -hmm. Well, you know where Reinhardt's clothing store was? I think so. Well, then if you go on up to the street, there was a, a bookstore, I think, after Reinhardt's and then an alley, and then there was a Long's, mm -hmm. and then there was a Jewel Tea Company or something, mm -hmm. and something else. But across the street from there was the Mercantile Bank and and Alba Dairy, which was uh, where they they had sold ice cream and milkshakes mm -hmm. and stuff. And so he'd take me in there. I like banana nut ice cream, and he'd <laughs> say, "You only sure you don't want more than one ice cream cone?" <laughs> and uh, he took me up in his office one day, and he had a great big roll talk desk, mm -hmm. and, and that desk is still out there in the in the old office. Mm -hmm on uh, Long's property mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And he opened up one of the drug drawers and reached in and he pulled out a Hamilton railroad watch. You ever seen what, mm -hmm. uh, what a railroad watch Pocket looked? Pocket watch? Pocket watch. Mm -hmm. And you press the top and the thing opens mm -hmm. up. And uh, you had to wind it with a little key. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, it was a beautiful thing. Wow. And he says, here, I want you to have this. And I says, oh, boy, that's an awful fancy watch for me. And he says, I want you to have it. So Then he told me later that, you ever heard of Tom Mix? Mm -hmm. He used to be a cowboy in the movies. But he was also a big, big game man. Mm -hmm. And he went to Africa and got all kind of big games and stuff. Mm -hmm. And he had a circus called it Tom Mix Circus, and it came to town one day, and J.D. says, well, i got to take it to the circus. And so he took me and introduced me to Tom Mix, and wow. I watched the circus. What an interesting You know, he was always reaching out to somebody, you know. He, 
He was a, just a wonderful man. Almost a, maybe a father figure for you, I wonder. If that well, or... possibly he was because my father and I weren't, you know, you know we talked to each other, but that was about the end of it. Mm -hmm. My father gave me a quarter once, and that's all I ever got from my mm -hmm. father. But, uh, so Mr. Long was very kind to you. Yeah, he was nice to me, and he, mm -hmm. you know, gave me a pretty good income. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was when when in the Navy, I, I think I was making thirty dollars a week, which was quite a bit of money for a young guy, <laughs> sixteen years old. Mm -hmm. You know, and during the Depression, it was a lot of money. But anyway, uh, mm. he, there's two men that I really admired. And one was uh, my seventh grade homeroom teacher. His name was Bishop. Mm. And uh, you're running out of time? Got a few more minutes. Yeah. What do you want? Any questions you want to ask me? Well, tell me more about, did you work for Long's any time later in life? Did you come back? Well, when I got out of the Navy, I, uh, you know, I was working for Long's when I went in the Navy, right. and I came back and worked for him for two or three days. <laughs> three days? <laughs> and I didn't, wasn't too interested in that anymore, and I went and got a job at J.C. Penney's. I worked for them for three or four days. <laughs> and I didn't like that too well, and uh, I uh, decided to go to Estes Park, and I worked up there at the grocery store that summer, and then I went to Oregon. And when I came back from Oregon, I worked for Rocky Flats, mm -hmm. and uh, then I uh, started playing music, and uh, I came, coming back on a, from Denver one time, and I was listening to the radio, and, uh, and he said they were looking for air traffic controllers to work in Alaska hmm. because uh, they thought, you know, the Korean War was going on, and they thought that China may come across the Aleutian Islands like Japan did, hmm. and they. If Japan had it kept coming when they came, they would have taken over the west coast of the United States. Mm -hmm. But they didn't know that at the time, but they would have. Mm -hmm. So the, they started the North American Air Defense Command. Mm -hmm. And I answered the telegram. I, they said, send a telegram to Washington, and I sent it, and I told them my qualifications, and they sent it back, and they said, report to. Will Rogers Field in Oklahoma City to come to school. Hmm. And so I borrowed some money from my mother, <laughs> caught a bus and went, hmm. went to Oklahoma City and uh, stayed in a rooming house there. Cost me $15 a week room and board. Hmm. And I had a real nice little apartment hmm. and good food. And, and there were several other guys that was going to the school to stand at that same place. So we were able to go to school together. And, uh, and then when we graduated from that school, we went to Alaska. And I worked for them. Hmm. And that was an interesting time. I enjoyed that. Hmm. And then I made a lot of money when I was in Alaska. I just, everything I touched turned to gold. <laughs> and. Uh, So I have one more question before we, we wrap things up. What do you think that our modern society can learn from the past? What do you think we're missing today? Oh, I think personal values. People don't have any values anymore. Mm -hmm. They don't want to do a good job for anybody or they don't care if they start anything or are on time or anything that they just don't have a really good values anymore. Mm -hmm. I was taught by this teacher called Bishop that I was going to mention. Mm -hmm. 
and he had me recite or memorize the poem, If. We have one minute. Yeah, well, this had a lot of, you know, if I have, if you ever heard If or not, if you can keep your head with all your pouch or losing yes. theirs and blaming right. it on you. Well, it had a lot of, a lot of goals in there. Okay. And if you could think about something to make a decision, mm -hmm. it helped, helped me make a lot of good decisions through life. Good. Well, thank you so much. This okay. has really it's been interesting, and we, we so appreciate your time well, and, I and appreciate knowledge. It. Yeah, I uh, got lots of stories. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe we can come back another time. Yeah, I doubt it, but. <laughs>